Greetings. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Fred in Alaska. Um, let's see. Uh, I had, I had something to mention. Uh, oh, update on the website. There, there should be a link, uh, real soon to, um, hats and some other stuff. Uh, thanks again to Miss Lynn and Dave the Tech Guy. Dave the Tech Guy hasn't been being lazy. He's just been swamped with other stuff. So, but I appreciate their time and their efforts in that. Uh, sincerely. It, great job um also i want to thank all the uh all my fellow natives that have been reaching out sharing and whatnot um i i know it's not easy and i appreciate you coming forward and again those who want to share and keep your name out of it uh exact location out of it uh i view it more like uh, public safety so if you have something to share just just reach out you know no judgment just you know let me hear it even if I don't share it with others, you know, uh, it, it's good to get it off your chest for one, but I'd, I'd prefer to be able to, you know, share with everybody, you know, under, you know, public safety. I mean, we all go out in the woods up here and, uh, today's share is a perfect example of that. Um, Doug, First Nations, uh, he's originally from, uh, we'll just say, up northern coast and his wife claire uh he's been living in anchorage uh for the last 15 years since he got out of college now his adventure started not this last fall but the year before fall where he actually the first time he went hunting outside of his traditional homelands where he's used to hunting and so they ended up in a very familiar place to me, which is south of the Denali Highway, uh, along the North Fork of the Golcana River. Uh, just, it would be south of Swede Lake, and just north of the Alphabets, as we call them, the Alphabet Mountains. And so on his hunting trip, that initially sparked his curiosity about the place, they, they had a great caribou hunting trip, and he loved it. So he told himself when he made it back from that trip that... You know, he told his wife, Claire, that uh, next year I want you and his 15-year-old son to go with and we'll, we'll just us three go. Because when he went, they saw a black bear, they saw some moose, and they saw the caribou. So in his mind's eye, it was a relatively safe place. Of course, he'd go, you know, loaded for bear, so to speak. But he, he got a good vibe about the area and what was going on. So, you know, he felt totally comfortable, that, you know, this last fall taking Claire and his 15 year old son back out there uh once they got to the hunting grounds that uh that parking lot has uh when they got there it was packed uh very very packed uh, a lot of trailers and everything and so he was thinking the worst you know he had invested money in new four-wheelers uh, one for his wife and son to ride on and one for him to tow uh, basically their equipment to to spend a good four or five maybe even six days depending on uh, how well it went out there and so he was kind of a little bit like yeah dang i you know he's like well we're here let's make the best of it so they load up and it's a few hours you know taking their time getting down to the north fork of the Golcana where they crossed and again uh once you pass swede lake on this particular trail you have to drop down to the north fork of the Golcana, and they were there before daylight they had gotten to the crest to drop down to the river at daylight and it was frosty uh it, it was nerve-wracking getting down there uh new equipment to him he's a you know avid four-wheeler rider but it, just learning the quirks of the new machine his wife not being very experienced so he had a lot of concerns so he went down first with the trailer and then uh they had little handheld uh walkie talkies and he radioed up come on down you know ride the brake etc etc because it, it, it's a pretty steep drop i've been there done that so they get down there they find a good crossing spot it wasn't overly high and uh because it hadn't been raining too much and so they get across and it's shantytown uh, anyone who's been there knows exactly what i'm talking about fuck it looks like somalia with all the little shanties and little makeshift hunting sites and it literally runs along the trail all the way up to the fucking the foothills of the alphabets damnedest thing i ever seen 
So once they cross, he decides, I don't want to be in Shantytown. He decides he's going to head basically due west. And he picked a trail that was not the best trail. It went right along the river and it had been obviously not well used or anyone to maintain. So as he's going along, he'd have to stop, uh, hack stuff down. And, and, and it, it was work. So he finally gets to a spot and they cut across the tundra to the bottom of one of these buttes. Now out there, it's basically rolling hills. I I don't consider them mountains, but whatever. It, it, big rolling hills and some of these butte-like structures coming out of the tundra. So he sees one off in the distance and says, well, that's a good one. It I, I know right where to find the river. We won't get lost. Let's, you know, easy to find camp at the end of the day. We'll go there. So they kind of quasi break trail, find some old trails and fight through and finally get there after getting well familiar with his winch, uh, getting unstuck and everything. Uh, his words, not mine. So they, they pick a spot, uh, basically on a small shelf and there's other shelves above them going up this butte. Now where he picked, he, he scouted first once they got there, you know, uh, the wife and the boy were, uh, Claire and his son were eating lunch. They had pre-made some sandwiches or whatever. And he took his sandwich and went for a little walk, looking to make sure there wasn't big, loose rocks, any kind of hazards that may come down on them. And there was nothing. It was shale-like rock and it, it, nothing, nothing to be concerned about as far as anything tumbling down on them. And so satisfied with that, they break out camp. Now, he invested in a 10 by 12 heavy duty canvas tent from Alaska Tent and Tarp and also bought a three, four hundred dollar little wood stove. Right. But he wanted his family to be comfortable because he was cold the year before and wasn't going to have that for his family. He wanted, you know, comfort glamping, as he called it. Anyway, so they're all set up uh, and, you know, it's just past midday when they're fully set up. Uh, or maybe closer towards evening. He he doesn't remember offhand because there's so much going on with unpacking and getting stuff right and all that. Well, uh, his wife Claire starts cooking. And they brought a couple different ways to cook. One was to cook directly on the stove with a, a cast iron skillet or the standard Coleman, four burner, whatever. So his wife's cooking on the four burner and they have it on the back of the her four wheeler. And as she's she's cooking or whatever, um, he said he kept hearing a weird, very sharp, piercing whistle way off in the distance. And and it was the damnedest thing he ever heard because it wasn't a whistle that uh, he had ever heard in all of his years in Alaska. Uh, and, you know, he, he chalks it up to, well, I'm from up north. It's probably just something I haven't experienced down here. And it just didn't happen last year for whatever reason. So... He's dismissing things, you know. Well, it gets to a point uh, of this whistling. Over time, it's not happening at a regular cadence. It, it's it's just periodically and random. But it sounds like it's getting closer. And he's like, man, that's just a damn thing. And it sounds like it's... Okay, in that area, there's a small little bit of a valley from the North Fork of the Golcana to the Alphabets. It's, it's you know, there's a few beaver ponds. You know, you got the river on the far side of the valley. And you know, various scrub brush and stuff. So he's he's thinking, well, it sounds like it's coming from just up on our side of the valley, but who knows? Maybe it's a hunter. They're lost. They got a, a whistle to get someone's attention. So he's like, all right, since you're cooking, I'm going to jump on my wheeler since I have the more powerful four-wheeler, and I'm going to go over that way, and I'm going to see who's whistling. They, they might need help. And his wife's all for it. She's like, yeah, go ahead. So he grabs his firearms, puts uh he had a 454 cussel on his hip and i i believe he just had a 30 out six rifle over his shoulder uh, that or a 300 wind mag he had named both but he he said he brought one and i, I forget exactly which one anyway high caliber rifle and he blurp, rips on out there doesn't hear anything again sees nothing and and gets to a point where he just gets this overwhelming feeling he's being watched and he gets the creeps like uh, he, he said he wanted to flee his skin. I understand that feeling. So he followed his gut, turned around and went right back to camp. He, he only went back about a mile and a half. He said, 
looking for the source of this whistle, trying to be helpful. So once he gets back to camp, the food has been done. It's kind of getting cool. His wife warms it up a little bit for him. And they all tuck into the canvas tent, and he's uh, looking over topographical maps on where he wants to take the three of them first light and go looking for these caribou because he had a few spots he had picked out the year before that. Oh, that'd be a good spot kind of thing, you know? So the, he eats, and they're all lounging around just talking family stuff, you know, just whatever, you know, whatever family functions, etc. That that kind of, just family talk. And he had... Uh, went outside of the tent to use the bathroom they brought one of those little five gallon bucket luggable loos i actually got one over on my my porch but um basically a five gallon bucket with a makeshift toilet seat on the top that latches shut anyway they had one of those so he went out to do his business and it's getting on into dark uh, about twilight and as he's sitting doing taking care of his business he hears a scream. It sounded way, way off in the distance. And <clears throat> he said the scream gave him the shivers. Uh, from head to toe, he he didn't feel it was natural. Uh, he, he When he first heard the scream, he said he envisioned it being like a banshee or something, you know. And so he was a little freaked out by it, uh, stirred in his spirit. And so he finishes his business. Um, and then commences to set up a tarp around this little porta potta area for uh, his wife's privacy, you know, uh, trying to think ahead and just kind of bored, really, and gets it all set up, you know, goes back in the tent, and now it's on into full-on dark. He said it had been about 45 minutes had passed, and, it, and darkness had set in. There's just the slightest twinge of twilight in the sky. And he hears another scream that sounds like it's coming right up at the top of this butte that they're basically at the base of. And he was like, I, what the hell? He said it it was so ear-piercingly loud, but yet low. So he, he was like, it sounded like there was a couple octaves, one real high, one real low. And it just reverberated across the valley. And he was like, wow, that's going to wake a lot of people up. Uh, if they're not already asleep. Well, as he's sitting there contemplating this scream, he starts thinking back to his childhood and stories of the hairy man. And he, he thought to himself initially, nah, nah. There, there's this party, you know, young hunters out there whooping it up partying, you know, they'll, they'll calm down. So he dismisses that. Uh, about another hour, he said, goes by, and his son, out of boredom and batteries dying on his little handheld video game, decides, you know, he's going to go out, and uh, they were going to start a campfire, uh, roast some marshmallows before calling it a night. So he goes out, uh, him and his boy, and his mom's getting all the graham crackers and all that kind of stuff ready for the s'mores and whatnot. Well, they're building the fire. And they hear another scream. Uh, this one sounded a, a little bit closer than the other scream. But he said it was too close for comfort. Uh, it really spooked his son. Uh, his son didn't want s'mores anymore. He didn't want to be outside of the tent. He didn't even want to be there. But he especially didn't want to leave the inside of the tent. And whatever, you know, in his young mind, that was a, a false sense of security, basically. And, and I, I get it. So... As Doug is, is sitting there talking to his wife, because his wife heard it very clearly, comes out and goes, another scream. That 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 sounded closer. And, and so they're discussing this. And as they're talking about it, uh, they had just gotten the fire going. And he, he says, I'm just going to let this burn out. I'll watch it. Um, I'll, I'll kind of keep watching and, and keep listening. And you guys can stay in the tent or whatever. And she goes, no, no, I'll sit out here with you for a little bit. So as they're sitting out there, uh, kind of just, he he told her some of the hairy man stories he had heard but he he was still kind of basically on the fence he goes i heard the stories and i met people that told them to me but i haven't seen anything so i i don't know i don't know but this doesn't sound right and so they sit there they do their thing the fire dies down enough to where he feels comfortable putting it out uh, and uh, so they had limited fresh water with them and not an immediate water source to douse it so 
he basically let it burn down a little more so he didn't have to use as much water to kill the flames uh it had been not recently raining but it was the ground was wet enough but still just being responsible you know and as he's pouring the water and it's steaming and everything um immediately it, uh, without the light of the fire it starts getting real dark around him so he has to pause what he's doing go in the tent put on a headlamp comes back out with his headlamp on and and is doing his thing and kicking around the little pieces of log left and everything and uh, his wife and son were inside and they were uh, reading some book together and as he's standing by the fire he said he heard what he thought was a rock tumbling down the side of this butte through the brush because I mean you got small willows and alders and stuff all through there so uh, he was he was like, oh crap, you know, there's a rock tumbling, but I, I checked earlier, there was nothing loose, and so he stops and he's listening, and he noticed that it wasn't, the sound wasn't coming directly down, but it was kind of going crisscross back and then forth with the noise, because once he started paying attention, it was easy for him to discern what direction the noise was was going, but it was it was something heavy, real real heavy. And, and making crashing and thrashing. And so uh, with that happening, he gets this eerie feeling of being watched again. And this time it's three times as bad, four times as bad as what he felt on his little four-wheeler trip. So he goes inside the tent, uh, tells his wife, keep a firearm near you. Uh, I don't know what's going on, but there's something big moving around just up the hill from us. And his wife wanted no parts of that shit. Uh, she was like, well, let's we'll leave this shit here. We'll get on the wheelers and we'll get out of here. And, and he calmed her down and said, we can't necessarily do that safely in the dark. And then cross the river in the dark. We can't do it safely in the dark. We can do it first light. She calms down. Um, she grabs one of his firearms uh, that he had brought for her to have protection if, if she stayed in camp or whatever. So she's sitting on their, uh, they had a, a king size cot and she's sitting on that and he's sitting on one end by the, where the uh, zipper for the door is. And they're sitting there and they had a couple of those LED lanterns on, on each side of the tent up at the peak. Um, so as his son was continued reading the book himself, him and his mom were reading, uh, Doug and his wife Claire were discussing, you know, uh, what they were going to initially bring on their way out in the morning. And, he, you know, Doug was telling her who he was going to get whoever's help to come and retrieve all the stuff. And, uh, you know, we'll call it good. We'll, we'll do it a different time in a different place. And as they were discussing it, they weren't paying attention, but their son was in the corner of this tent area on his sleeping bags just kind of leaned back reading this book but he would look over and watch his parents and as he was doing so he notices movement on the tent the tent canvas something was was pushing it in and kind of moving along on it he was immediately was like started pointing and was like hey hey what what's that what dad what's that so doug turns and looks and it's immediately off to his side and it was just behind where the wood stove was a uh, little, little wood stove and he saw the movement and said hey hey we're in here uh yells and then here's just thud 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 and crashing into the uh, into the brush and was everyone was immediately freaked out um they ended up sitting uh in the center of the tent uh with guns nearby uh his son knew how to shoot so he made sure his son was armed uh and they were basically, in essence, all back to back, periodically looking for movement on the tent. They heard the thrashing initially when he said, hey, hey, we're in here. And, and it was dead quiet the rest of the night. Uh, none of them slept until just before dawn, his son fell asleep. And Claire was starting to doze. And, and just as they were starting to doze off, up that butte from, oh, excuse me, up, up the butte from where they were, he heard that scream again immediately everyone's back up and that that was the last thing they heard uh and, and saw nothing um this whole time they saw nothing 
And so first light comes, they had the pertinent stuff and they wheelered on out of there. Uh, Doug, I want to thank you for sharing that. Not, not his real name. Uh, it was hard for him to share because, uh, because it involved his wife and son immediately in the situation he has a different emotional reaction to that uh that that protective you know papa bear kind of thing which i totally understand and respect um but it was hard for him to share it not not hard to tell me about just to get it out it was hard for him uh because it made him feel less than uh, even though he did all the right things and was a man about it, in my opinion, you know. Um, but in the moment, he said he felt very, very little. And and I get it, you know. Um, again, thanks to Doug and Claire for sharing. Um, and uh, we will catch you guys on the next one. Thanks.